Yeah, I don't have a, a regular S meter on this uh, uh, radio, but it's about uh, you know about half scale, so it's like five by six, five by seven over. Very good, Dale. Uh, KW1I, this is WU2D. Thank you for the uh, 5657 copy. Um, I'm doing 5 watts out uh, of average power and uh, we're making uh, AM with suppressor grid modulation. And I'm using a, uh, a vertical loop. Uh, it's horizontally polarized and it's roughly uh, pointing west, west and east. But uh, this is nice. This is the first contact on my little um, suppressor grid uh, peanut tube transmitter into the uh, linear amplifier which brings it from a quarter watt up to five watts. Over. Okay Mike. Well it's, um, it's clear and, uh, and it's steady up here. I didn't check on the frequency steady but I'm sure it is. But uh, I'm on AM and uh, you may be S5, S6. I don't know. It's, uh, it's not a real noisy uh, day here up on 10 meters, and uh, there's quite a bit of noise in there, but I don't miss a word. So I would say uh, you have some uh, great success there, Mike, W2D, KW1I. I want to talk a little bit about linear amplification and linear amplifiers uh, during this, uh, this video as we try to put a little linear amplifier at the other end of our uh, one tube trans transmitter. The one tube transmitter puts out about a quarter watt and I've heard tell that tubes like the 6146 are able to be driven with almost no power so let's see if we can make a linear amplifier using the 6146 tube um, something that will be able to pep up our little quarter watt to something in the 2 to 5 watt range and then we can try to make a 10 meter contact. Now initially I wanted to try the 5763 or the 6CL6 type class tube and I do go through some of that in the video. It did work but I was only able to get a couple of watts uh, maybe three watts reliably out of this and I think I was stressing the tube. It was really really hot. So I did move up to the 6146 tube and uh, we'll go through some of the different flavors of this tube. We'll go through neutralization and how important that is. The first thing I want to talk about is a question. I'm going to ask you guys a question. Is AM linear amplification the same as single sideband linear amplification? Now we all use our linear amplifiers to uh, amplify AM signals or single sideband signals. But does that mean that the linear amplifier is optimized for both modes? We're going to find out that the linear amplifier is not optimized for AM when it is optimized for single sideband. And that there are some subtle changes in the biasing and subtle changes in the expectations uh, with, regu with regard to regulation of the power supplies when you go between those two modes. So your run-of-the-mill linear amplifier that works so well on single sideband may not work so well on AM. We're only trying to make a few watts with this linear amplifier, and I think that we can uh, get there very quickly without going too crazy. But uh, I want to start with the 5763 and then work up to the 6146 to see if we can get a few watts out of our uh, little peanut whistle 10 meter transmitter. Let's talk about the configuration of linear amplifiers first. The most common configuration for linear amplifiers has always been the grounded cathode configuration. Most class A amplifiers use the, uh, the grounded cathode configuration for RF and audio amplification at low levels. But with any given tube, the grounded grid configuration 
gives the best for low distortion and it's a lower part count and a much simpler design. So grounded grid has become very, very popular for linear amplifiers. And as far as bias goes with RF linear amplifiers, class A is going to give you the most gain, uh, but it has the lowest efficiency. It's usually less than 50%. And this is with a tuned type amplifier. Uh, you'll see these in the driver stages uh, that precede most linear amplifiers. They will be class A. Class B is kind of a misnomer with RF amplifiers because it, it's almost always a weak class AB. In other words, there has to be some bias because you don't want to have uh, distortion around the 180 degree point on the waveform. Um, class B gives the highest gain uh, but it also uh, has the highest distortion, again, around the 180 point. So we talk about class AB. Uh, class AB is a compromise between A and B, so it's going to give you a compromise between a theoretical 50% efficiency and a theoretical 78% efficiency. Um, when you talk about class AB1 or class AB2, um, this is normally just a talking about the amount of bias you have on the stage and how hard you are driving the stage. A class AB2 amplifier uses the drive itself to uh, make grid current flow and self-bias the stage. Now we only have 250 milliwatts of drive and by the time we get through uh, the relays, the uh, coax, the connectors, the tuned circuit losses, and all the parasitic suppressors, we're not going to have that much to drive the amplifier. So I think we're going to go with a conventional common cathode class AB1 style amplifier, not a grounded grid. And we're going to set the resting current very high so we get good linearity. This can be as high as one third to one half of the rated plate dissipation of the tube. So I'd like to talk a little bit about linear amplifiers and uh, let's go through a few schematics first. Um, I had some questions about building a linear amplifier for my little flea power transmitter that puts out about a quarter watt. And of course the first thing that comes out of people is why aren't you doing this with a solid state amplifier like a, a MOSFET amplifier? Isn't even a bipolar amplifier would be a lot simpler than trying to do this with a tube. And that is an absolutely correct statement. And certainly simple MOSFET amplifiers where you have a very safe 12 to 25, 30 volt rail is going to be a whole lot easier to build and a whole lot simpler than trying to do what we're doing by using a vacuum tube amplifier. So let's just get that right out before I even start. So let's go to our tube type linear amplifier design. And many of these come from the early 60s. Um, this is an RF compactron type circuit. I believe that this amplifier was originally designed to increase the Heathkit tour, which put out two or three watts of AM and brought it up to the 35 or 40 watt level. Now some of the features that are in this amplifier include a fairly stiff bias supply made so by this large capacitor and a fairly well uh, regulated and lower screen voltage. You can see here we have quite a large screen feed resistor. This is much larger than we normally would use with uh, regular amplifiers. But uh, in general you want to keep the screen voltage uh, quite low compared to the high voltage on the plate. Uh, the other thing we notice is that uh, this is a link coupled design rather than a pi output. Uh, this works very well on uh, 10 meters and uh, a lot of people like using this design better than using a Pi network. If you're only doing a single band design like our 10 meter amplifier, uh, this link coupled 
amplifier type circuit works very well. The other thing you notice with this amplifier is there's no neutralization. They're simply using a shield between the grid circuit and the plate circuit. There must not be very much capacitance in here and uh, they're getting away with uh, no neutralization. Now we go into a full-blown 6146B type linear amplifier and this is uh, you might recognize this as the AA8 Victor type amplifier very popular and well done. Um, this one has been modified. Um, I've got the 10 meter components in there instead of the multiband setup. Also there is a changeover relay that allows us to be in line or out of line and the third pole of the relay actually opens up the bias uh, voltage divider thus cutting off the tube when you're in receive mode and that takes the temperature of the tube way down when you're cutting it off. As soon as you go to transmit it clicks in and it clicks this relay closed and the bias goes to the proper class AB uh, level uh, for uh, AM transmission. Notice that the again the screen voltage is low and it's well regulated with a large capacitor on the screen. Any variation in the screen will directly uh, affect your modulation envelope and it will uh, affect it in a negative manner meaning you won't get the upward swing in your waveform if this is not a stiff uh, voltage. It's a, it acts almost as a negative feedback point and will take away from your talk power if the screen is not well regulated and fairly low voltage compared to the high voltage. Uh, the other deluxe thing with this particular setup, he's got some nice metering going on. So we have the grid current metered, the screen current metered, and the plate current metered. That's pretty deluxe. All done with a single 50 microamp meter too. So look at the uh, neutralization. We have uh, uh, a series capacitor. Uh, I like using a fixed capacitor and not just a single tunable capacitor to the plate. This gives me uh, some double protection uh, voltage wise. Uh, when you're adjusting this it's kind of nice not to have the high voltage on both sides and this gives you a little bit of protection. Again make this as high as you can get. Two to three kilovolts is better than one. So this is the general form of the amplifier that I'm going to build. I'm first going to try it with 5763 instead of a 6146, but essentially think of them as the same tubes, just one has a little less plate dissipation than the other. And finally I wanted to show you the little firecracker amp. This is uh, another popular amplifier. This guy uses uh, wires to do the uh, neutralization and each tube is independently neutralized. So one thing that we're going to find out is we really don't have enough drive to show uh, what these amplifiers can really do. And uh, you guys are used to having these amplifiers put out 40, 50, 60, 70 watts. Uh, they're really not able to do that um, unless they are driven hard enough. And usually that means you need a class A driver between the little oscillator and the power amplifier. So I have to pick on the uh, 101 easy ham radio projects again uh, with uh, regards to uh, Robert Brown and Tom Nitell. Uh, this one's just too good not to comment on. It's a 50 megahertz linear amplifier. Of course this could just as well be for 10 meters where we're uh, working. But um, they're using a grounded grid circuit but it's drawn in an interesting way so it kind of looks like a common cathode circuit but it isn't. I assure you this is grounded grid and you're feeding the signal into the cathodes. So what they have is a grounded grid stage that's kind of like a driver and that's going into a grounded grid push-pull configuration. Not something you see very often. 
So the, the advantage of the push-pull, of course, is it uh, rejects even harmonics. So the second harmonic would be quite low uh, with this ampli amplifier topology. The only thing that, that kind of confuses me is they don't seem to be handling the grid bias at all. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any bias whatsoever on this amplifier. And again, this just kind of shows the um, the ability for the grounded grid amplifier to be a little more tolerant. And uh, they're kind of winking at the whole idea of uh, setting up the bias in the amplifier. So apparently this guy does not explode with no negative bias on it. In other words, the tubes don't run away and over dissipate. But I would have to actually hook this up and try it before I would believe it works. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about this circuit. And uh, we can move on now. OK, I, I didn't catch that, although he had an excellent signal here with that uh, new homebrew rig, which I've heard several times now. And, uh, well, we got the I old military the radio net on this so morning, so let me turn that down. And somebody puts a new homebrew tube in. And uh, that's what happens when you have the net on and a nice strong signal like any one S Larry comes on. So let's go over some of the choices that you might make when you're building a linear amplifier. Now, in our case, we only want to increase the signal to the 2 to 5 watt kind of level. So you could certainly use a tube like a 6CL6 or a 5763, these two little peanut tubes. But um, other tubes are, are great candidates. I mean, certainly a 6DQ6 or 6146 types would be an excellent choice for this. And that's probably what I'll do. But uh, people have built linears out of almost anything they can get their hands on. Um, everything from the lowly 6L6 and 6AG7 uh, to modern compactrons and uh, external anode type tubes and everything in between. These sweep tubes became very popular in the 60s and 70s. Uh, they were the output horizontal deflection amplifiers and televisions, especially the color television type tubes like the 6LQ6, Novars, these type of things. They became very popular for uh, linear amplifiers. There's many different styles. Um, the grounded grid styles uh, have become the most popular because they're the simplest and they generally take a little bit of power to drive them and that's what you've got. If you use a conventional uh, grounded cathode type circuit, you almost have too much power when you get much over a few hundred milliwatts. Um, I've made linear amplifiers out of the old 829 and 832 push-pull type tubes as well. So. Um, the 2E26 tube, which is in the box here, that's like a miniature version of the 6146. That would be a good candidate for this project as well. So anyway, I just wanted to show you the lowdown on some of the types of tubes that you might see in linear amplifiers. Nothing special here. Of course, the 811 is the standby for the zero bias style grounded grid type amplifiers. But these also work very well in the grounded cathode type, but that's way above the power level that we're interested in. So I have to cut this video off because it's getting a little bit long. We'll do a second part to finish it up. But uh, I want to make a point that the problem with using linear amplification on an AM signal comes down to the amount that you're transmitting. Remember with AM, even if you're not talking, you're putting out a steady carrier. The tube has to be able to handle that all the time. And as you add the sideband energy when you're talking, of course, things change with the, the amount of dissipation, but not markedly. So the, the limitations 
are really coming down to the dissipation of the tube. So to put out a, uh, you know, a 15 watt carrier, we might need a tube that's capable of 70 watts of dissipation. And uh, if you compare that to the single sideband uh, case, you can get upwards of efficiencies of 60% using that same tube, meaning that perhaps only 10 or 15 watts is being dissipated in the tube. And uh, it's putting out more peak envelope power because it's only transmitting one sideband. And when you stop talking, there's zero watts going out. So AM linear amplification is not really practical until you're talking about large setups. Uh, very large tube linear amplifiers, you can start to get some benefit. The other sweet spot is where you do have that 2 to 5 watt output that you perhaps want to bring up to the 20 or 30 or 40 watt level. A linear amplifier for AM can work in that limited condition. But if you have a transmitter that's already putting out 100 watts, you're not going to get too much by using a linear amplifier. You may get a few dB, but it's not going to be that big gain that you get if you're operating in single sideband. So I hope you've enjoyed this first video on linear amplification. I'll dig a little deeper into the amplifier and see how it was constructed in our next video.